Hello, Dr. Lewis. Thank you for taking some time this morning uh, to chat with me. Sure, it's my pleasure. Um, so you tweeted this morning, and The Economist just published today, a big story about using open source intelligence in the work that you do. What is open source intelligence? Just a really general des description of that. I mean, just to put it really simply, it's using all of the public information that is available in this era of data ubiquity from our cell phones and our social media accounts or commercial satellites and taking all that data. And what we do with it is we study the spread of nuclear weapons. Um, so is it a little like citizen science? Do people do this at home and they pass on information to you? Is that part of the open source intelligence networking? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, while you know, some of us are academics and our students are people who are studying it full time. Anybody can do this. And I often say that everybody is an expert in something. So one of the things The Economist talked about was uh, a group I have, uh, a Slack channel of people who are supporters of my podcast, Arms Control Wonk. Uh, they're doing a whole bunch of work together. Uh, and some of that work is literally described in The Economist uh, section. And I think probably my favorite example of this is we had a really thorny problem relating to a North Korean truck that carried a missile. And we had no idea about how to solve this problem or what to think about it. Uh, and so one of my colleagues, she put it up on Facebook and her cousin, who's a truck driver in Canada, thought we were idiots and answered it in 30 seconds. <laughs> so Everybody's an expert in something and that's right. working together, we can make the world a better place. Which is easy to do with the internet. I mean, that's, it's the amazing thing that ties all this together is just how easy it is now to collect, store, and share information. Have you heard any pushback from government agencies? Like, whoa, 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 you're saying too much. Please don't talk about that. Do you hear from those agencies? Well, the government's a big place, right? So we get a mix of responses. Some people are very excited because um, they may have the same opinions that we do, but it's based on secret information and they can't share. Uh, so we've definitely been told by some folks in the government, they find what we do useful because uh, they can take something we've written and show it to another country and say, see, this is why we don't want you to do this. Uh, but then, yes, there are definitely concerns where when people have a monopoly on information, they have a sense of power and control. And I think not everybody is, is real excited about moving into this new era of openness and transparency. What about sort of a dark side of this? Are there conspiracy theorists out there who are using the same information for darker purposes? Well, the first thing I would say is this has always been a problem. We have always had conspiracy theorists and state-sponsored disinformation and all of this garbage. And just as open source information has become very popular, we see the conspiracy theorists and the sponsors of disinformation sort of uh, mimicking that, um, you know, doing their own kind of fake open source work. And then, you know, on top of it, there's always going to be bad work, right? I mean, there are smart people and dumb people in the world. It's just inevitable. Um, what I would say, though, is the difference in this era is that because the information is open, you can see the work. So people can do a bad open source analysis, uh, but we can see the picture and we can get our own pictures and, and we can sort of then go back and forth and explain why it's wrong. And at least to me, that's probably better than the old days when a government could make a claim and we had no way of fact checking it. So, you know, the new era is by no means perfect. Um, it can be really, really frustrating when you see garbage online. Um, but I am someone who believes that when things are open and transparent, we have a much better opportunity to fact check them. Of course, the Economist story is coming out this week and today, but you've been doing this work for so long. Is it a thing where you're like, yeah, great, now you're catching up with me? Or are you <laughs> excited to see more people talking about it? Well, look, I'm always happy to see more people talking about it. Uh, for me, the foundational experience of my professional career was being a grad student during the run-up to the invasion of Iraq. And that was a case where, you know, I just felt so powerless because there were all these intelligence claims being made. Um, no one I knew believed them, um, but no one listened to us because how are you going to criticize some secret information? And so I have always been motivated by that experience to want to try to take the secret discussion and create a kind of parallel open discussion where everyone can participate because I, I think that's better for democracy. So sure, part of me says, gee, what took you so long? But on the other hand, uh, you just got to enjoy it when, when it happens.
There was a specific last week, the week before, you were looking at some satellite images from Planet. I want to ask you about them in just a moment, of China and these nuclear silos that you seem to identify. What's it like when you see some of those pictures? Is it aha moment? Do you say Eureka, wherever you seem to be looking at these images? Oh, it's it's the best feeling in the world, even when it's something bad, because there is this moment where you know you've put in all this work. And so you're tired and maybe a little cranky and you're uncertain if things are going to work out. And you know, you're like, well, I got all these images, but I have nothing to show for it. And like, what am I going to tell my boss I've been doing the last week? And you just you're feeling that real anxiety. And then you find something. And what is so amazing about that moment is you know it's going to be a really big story, but just for a moment, it's all yours. You're one of a handful of people who know this thing. Um, and, you know, I, I can see why secret information can be intoxicating for other people. But, you know, for us, we enjoy that moment and then we publish. There's a great partnership between the Monterey Institute for International Studies and Planet, the satellite uh, company. Talk a little bit about that and what Planet does. Yeah, sure. So uh, Planet is this company founded by two of my friends from when I was like 25 and living in Washington, D.C. I, I used to hang out at their group house. They still have a group house. It's <laughs> It's a little bigger group house now. <laughs> um, and, and they really have changed how uh, imaging from space is done for two reasons. One is they had this crazy idea that they would put up all these tiny satellites that are like the size of a bread box. Um, and they would try to take a picture of the earth every day. And you know they get pretty close to it. They don't get the whole earth every day and they're always clouds and things. Um, and the resolution of those images is you can sort of see buildings, but maybe not cars. Uh, but it completely changes it because you now suddenly have this ability to search the whole world for new buildings, new roads, uh, and it's getting frequently updated. And so they do that. And then they take the kind of pictures people are used to seeing a very high resolution where you can see, you know, cars and, and uh, things very distinctly. And when you put those two things together um, to have this baseline image of the earth every day, plus the ability to say, Ooh, I want to go take a closer look at that. Um, it, it just gives you this capability that I think even, even intelligence analysts working in the classified side would have been really psyched to have in the 1980s. You work with students at the Institute. What's it like to have those next generation of people who are looking to make the world a safer place working with you to guide those visions? Oh, that is the best part of the job. Uh, you know, I, I think in our field, it can be very depressing because often we're reporting on things that are unfortunate. Um, I was talking to somebody at Middlebury the other day and I was annoyed by something and she said, you know, come on, how can you be squeamish? What do you do? You know, like, look at what you do. And so on the one hand, you're dealing with this very serious set of problems. And the thing that is inspiring is seeing young people getting involved in this field and deciding that they're going to dedicate their careers to making a difference. And so it takes a little bit of a st the sting out of it. When I look back and think about all the things I wasn't able to accomplish and, and all, the, all the stupid decisions we weren't able to prevent people from making, I can at least look at this new generation and think like, well, maybe they will succeed where I did not. We happen to be chatting on the 76th day, uh, year after atomic weapons were first used against a human population. And I know that is sort of at the core of non-proliferation studies. How do you reflect on that as someone who works in this field? Well, it is absolutely central. Uh, until the pandemic, I actually went to Hiroshima every year, um, part of the governor of Hiroshima's round table on nuclear disarmament. Um, but obviously the last two years, we haven't been able to travel there. This year I have to do it by Zoom, which given time differences is gonna be uh, uh, quite the experience. But I think when we talk about nuclear weapons, the destruction that they are capable of inflicting is so great that we don't really ever want to focus on it. We don't want to think about it. And so even if you listen to people's language, it becomes very clinical. Um, people don't really talk about the effects of nuclear weapons. They, they just say, well, uh, you know, a city is destroyed, or we talk about deterrence, or we just find ways of talking about it without really engaging with the, the ugly reality of it. And so for me, going to Hiroshima is always a very centering experience because it takes the cost of these nuclear weapons, the dangers that they pose that we want to look away from, and it forces me to confront them and keep that at the center of my thinking um, as I go about doing this work. 
I think one of the images that sticks with me after looking at some of the from the so the remembrances this year or 75th last year is a watch frozen at that moment of when the blast happens and to imagine the human being that was wearing that watch that happened to be caught in the holocaust of what was going on it's just very sobering to think about so everyone who goes through the museum has a reaction like that to some object and one of the things we all talk about is well, what object is it for you? Um, so for my friend, Scott Sagan, who's a professor at Stanford, uh, it's a child's tricycle. Uh, and the tricycle itself has clearly been uh, damaged by the fire and slightly melted. And for him, that's just extremely moving. Uh, and the one that gets me are the collection of children's school uniforms, um, in part because the dark parts of the uniforms absorb the heat more than the light, and they're all burned out. Uh, and so, you know, I think that as human beings, it is so hard to get our minds around uh, suffering on that scale. It's, it's just so hard to take it all in um, that the only real the only real way we can process it is to look at objects and think about the experience of of one person and, and try to empathize and and experience it through that. My last question for you this morning is. What can a person do in their everyday life who may read The Economist article, see some of your work, listen to the podcast? What can they do? How can they advocate for a more peaceful planet? Well, look, everybody is an expert in something. And so you can just do this work. Um, if you're interested in it, you can volunteer. You can help out. We are always having questions that we can't answer and looking for people with different expertise. And so people can get involved in that way. Uh, people can get involved in the political process. I mean, I think one thing that has really disappointed me in the past 20 or 30 years is how partisan a lot of these issues have become. Um, you know, they, they, they're, they're always an aspect of partisan politics in America, but it wasn't like it is today. Um, you know, some of my closest friends work for Republicans in the Senate on these very same issues. Uh, and you know, we got along really well because we cared both about solving this problem. And so, you know, regardless of your partisan affiliation, pushing your representatives and, and senators to be mindful about these things, uh, I think is something you can do. Um, and then, you know, there's, I think, just generally supporting educational institutions, uh, you know, like the Middlebury Institute, because um, there are a lot of people who have opinions about this stuff um, and, and that's fine. Um, but more than just people with opinions about these stuff, this stuff, what we need are young professionals who are really well trained so that when they go into government, um, they can they can go ahead and, and, and really make better choices for us. Thank you so much. Your work is really inspiring. Your humor is an essential part of balancing out that you share on Twitter with the stuff that you post out there. Thank you for taking some time today. My pleasure.